Number 1. Juan Pedro Martinez was 10 years old in 1986. He was a spirited young boy with black hair and dark brown eyes. He stood around 5'4 and weighed around 140 pounds. His father was named Andres Martinez and his mother was named Carmen Gomez. He had accompanied his father on short rides in the past but was keen to go to the Basque area of Spain after reading about it in school. Juan Pedro's father promised to take him on his next delivery to the region if Juan Pedro made good grades. Juan Pedro held up his end of the bargain. On June 25, 1986, a delivery to the Basque region came up. Andres was tasked with transporting 20,000 liters of sulfuric acid from Cartagena to Bilbao. He, Carmen, and Juan Pedro all hopped in the truck, ready to make the long journey together. The drive would take over eight hours, cover over 800 kilometers, roughly 515 miles, and take the family those steep, narrow mountain passes. As the family reached the Samosierra mountain pass, something was off. None of us will ever know what was happening in the truck cab that day, and many of the factors involved are still shrouded in mystery. Andres was apparently driving erratically, allegedly running at least one car off of the road and taking the mirror off of a second car. Despite the fact that the roads in the Samosierra mountain pass are steep, with sharp turns and cliffs, the truck sped towards 90 miles per hour. At one point, the truck tried to take a curve at too high of a speed and tipped. The cab of the truck buckled on impact, killing both Andres and Carmen instantly. The sulfuric acid began to spill into the area, and this triggered small explosions. Thousands of pounds of lime were brought in to soak up the sulfuric acid and keep it from reaching any nearby waterways. Investigators checked the brakes on the truck, initially believing that they had failed and caused the accident. But the brakes were intact, and no answers were found at the initial scene. When investigators realized that Juan Pedro should have been in the wreckage, they leapt into a search that is still going on to this day. There is not a lot of information out there about the investigation into the accident, but a few facets have trickled out to be public knowledge. Extensive searches of the area were conducted with no clues or signs of Juan Pedro found. Missing posters for Juan Pedro blanketed the area in case he had somehow managed to make his way away from the immediate area of the crash site. Besides those routine investigative routes, a few tips rolled in. Witnesses that saw the accident or came upon it claimed to have seen a white Nissan Vanette stop near the wreckage of the truck after the accident. It was driven by a tall man with a mustache. He was accompanied by a woman. Both individuals were described as very tall and Nordic looking, so likely fair in coloring. Onlookers claimed that they approached the crumpled truck Andres Martinez was driving and removed a small package before leaving the scene. It is important to stress that this is in no way verified and the accounts have possibly been exaggerated over time and as the story had spread over the internet. Additionally, the tachometer, the device in a vehicle that measures an engine's revolutions per minute on the delivery truck driven by Andres Martinez was recovered intact. It showed that the truck made 12 unexplained stops during their journey. These were short stops that did not match with traffic patterns, with the shortest stop lasting only one second. There is currently nothing to explain these stops, though some theorize that Andres was trying to avoid or signal another vehicle on the road, possible that white Nissan Vanette seen at the scene of the accident. However, these theories are not based in anything other than speculation. There were several sightings of a boy matching Juan Pedro Martinez's description after the accident. The first took place in Bilbao, which was the destination of the ill-fated trip. Most were never substantiated, and the reports often lacked any details to tie them back to Juan Pedro specifically. There is one often reported sighting that bears a striking similarity to Juan Pedro, however. In May of 1987, a blind woman entered a driving school in Madrid, Spain. The owner claimed that she was of Iranian descent and asked for the location of the U.S. Embassy. A boy of about 10 years old appeared to be guiding the woman. Number 2. On the evening of December 3, 1926, Agatha Christie and her husband Archie got into an argument. He had been having an affair with a woman named Nancy Neal, sometimes spelled Neal. 
He told Agatha he wanted a divorce and, to add insult to injury, that he would be spending the weekend with friends, a group which included Neil. When the fight was over, Christy went upstairs, kissed her seven-year-old daughter goodnight, and left the house in her Morris Cowley. The car was found near a chalk quarry the next morning. The lights were on and all of Christie's belongings were still inside. A young boy saw the car and alerted the police. The car sparked one of the largest investigations the United Kingdom has ever seen. Over a thousand police officers were put on the case to investigate, airplanes were tasked with flying over key points to look for clues, dogs were used to track her scent, rewards were offered and more. The public got involved as well, mounting their own searches and muddying the waters. Two of Christie's friends and fellow writers also began to investigate, albeit in very different ways. Dorothy Sayers visited the Christie home and scoured it, hoping for clues but finding nothing. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, on the other hand, took one of Christie's gloves to a psychic in hopes of finding a thread to follow. He was also unsuccessful. The only lead came around 10 days later. The hydropathic hotel in Harrogate was a swanky spa that boasted Turkish baths. The head waiter there thought they recognized a guest as Christie, though she claimed to be a South African woman named Teresa Neal. With this new information in hand, Archie and investigators traveled to Yorkshire, where the hydropathic hotel was located. Rather than confront the guest or gather information, they conducted a dining room stakeout. Sure enough, the woman known to staff as Teresa Neal blew in without a glance at Archie. Sure enough, Archie recognized the woman as his missing wife. When he spoke to her, onlookers say she looked genuinely puzzled and didn't seem to recognize him. But Agatha had been found. All of the theories in this case fall under one of two headings, either Christie disappeared due in some part to her husband or that she disappeared for an unrelated reason. For the purposes of this blog, we will cover five of the larger theories, though there are dozens of others. First, we'll cover three theories that are related to her relationship. The first theory is that Agatha Christie disappeared with the intention of dying by suicide. She had been presented with the idea of divorce by her husband, who had been carrying on an affair. It is possible that she felt this constituted enough of a disruption of her life that she saw no other way to cope. Of course, none of us knew what was going on in her head, so it is impossible to say. Along with this first theory, the second theory is that Christie disappeared while in a dissociative fugue. Briefly, a dissociative fugue is an amnesiac episode in which a person loses their sense of identity, memories, and typically travels. It's possible that the idea of divorce triggered this in her, but the fact that she tucked her daughter into bed before leaving does not point to this. It's possible that Christie went out that night to blow off steam and something else occurred to trigger a fugue state, but, again, we don't have anything to point to that. The next theory is that Christie purposefully staged her disappearance to ruin her husband's life. I have to say that I really like the spiteful revenge fantasy of this. It is possible that she disappeared with the intention of ruining her husband's weekend getaway with his mistress. Additionally, it's been said that Christie signed into the hotel under Neil, which was the surname of her husband's mistress. That is too intentional to ignore. The theories that fall under the unrelated to husband umbrella are varied. First is that some people believed that Agatha Christie had vanished because she was off investigating a homicide somewhere. There is no evidence, circumstantial or otherwise, to point to this, but I suppose it makes sense on a certain level that people would jump to this. One of the greatest minds in murder mystery writing goes off the grid, maybe she was called to do so. And then we have the more cynical and derogatory theory that the disappearance was a publicity stunt. This is another act of conclusion jumping that does make sense to me, we see ad campaigns that are interactive and not branded as the brainchild of ad execs. My issue with this theory is that Christie's career was never in danger of failing. She did not need a publicity stunt to get her name out there or boost sales. Based on what we know, I lean towards the idea that Christie left her home in a fit of passion, she was likely angry and frustrated with her husband and possibly feeling hopeless at the situation she found herself in. After the initial act of leaving, though, I'm less convinced of what happened, simply because 11 days is a long time to stay gone. 
What do you all think? Number three. Nancy was born on January 14, 1952. We don't know much about her early life or family, but it seems like all was relatively normal in her childhood. We know that she had been married and separated from one man prior to her disappearance and had a son around the age of 19. In 1975, Nancy was 23 years old. At that time, she stood between 5'2 and 5'3 tall and weighed somewhere between 90 and 100 pounds. She has reddish blonde hair, hazel eyes, and scars on the inside of both wrists. Unfortunately, that's about all we know when it comes to Nancy's life before her disappearance. If you know more about Nancy's personality or relationships, I'd love to hear more, shoot me an email. On July 4, 1975, Nancy was working at a FINA gas station in East Layton, Utah. She was on shift as a service attendant. She was last seen at 5.30 when a police officer drove by the station and saw her working. Fifteen minutes later, Nancy's manager arrived to take over for Nancy, only to find no sign of her. Her car was in the parking lot, her purse was inside the station, and the only sign of any theft was $10 worth of gas on a pump that hadn't been paid for. Nancy's purse contained $167 from her last paycheck. Nancy was last seen wearing a blue halter top with blue shorts. She had a gold pinky ring inlaid with a ruby in the center, with smaller rubies on either side of the center stone. She was also wearing her work uniform, a blue pinstripe smock type shirt with the FINA gas station logo embroidered on it. Nancy's investigation was taken seriously from the start. I think this is likely due to a few factors. First, Nancy disappeared from work, where her personal items remained, and no money was taken. This insinuates that she was the target, and the attack was not intended to be a robbery. Plus, Nancy did not have a track record of being an absentee or subpar employee, lending to the idea that her disappearance was not intentional. The second factor that likely led to Nancy's case to be taken seriously was the fact that she left her son with no communication, which family and friends say she would never have done of her own accord. And the third factor was likely the fact that several young women had already disappeared without a trace in Utah and no one knew what was going on. Investigators searched the scene and found only one lead. A truck was seen at the station moments before Nancy's disappearance. The truck has never been identified and it is unknown if it is actually connected to the disappearance in any substantial way. Searches of the area by foot and via helicopter were conducted the next day, but nothing was found. At a loss, investigators questioned Nancy's ex-husband and two other male friends. We all know that when something happens, it is typically someone close to the victim. But those interviews led nowhere and leads ran dry. The case went cold and is still cold, though investigators have made efforts towards progress in the recent past. In the 2010s, investigators began reinvestigating the case from scratch. They worked to create a DNA profile of Nancy, as one was not available. The Bundy connection here is admittedly tenuous, considering the fact that Nancy did not fall neatly into his preferred victim profile. By now, we all know the vast majority of Bundy's victims had brown hair, and Nancy's was somewhere between blonde and strawberry blonde. We do know that Bundy was in law school in Salt Lake City, Utah in 1975. He has been linked to other disappearances and murders around Utah at the time. That's all that really led to him being a suspect in this case. No one saw his car nearby. There was no mention of a mysterious law student in Nancy's life, nothing like we've seen in past cases. Additionally, during his death row confessions, Bundy was asked about Nancy Baird's disappearance directly. He denied being responsible for it, which means either he was lying for some unknown reason or someone else took Nancy that July 4th. I lean towards someone else abducting Nancy as a crime of opportunity, but agree Bundy can't be totally ruled out as the case currently stands. If you or anyone you know have any information about Nancy Baird's disappearance, please contact the proper authorities. Detectives have reopened the case as recently as 2014 and are searching for any leads or new information. You can contact the Davis County Sheriff's Department at 801-451-4100 
in reference to case number D11-04588. The name is case number is MP up number 11575. Number 4. Again, the old refrain. There isn't a lot of information about Susan Curtis online. We have no information about her childhood or her family. She was born on May 18, 1960. We know her mom's name was Marilyn and she had a sister. We know that Susan went by Sue or Sue Sue in her personal relationships. Based on what we know of her activities, she was very determined and responsible, for example, she rode her bike 50 miles from Bountiful to Utah to attend the youth conference she disappeared from. She was very athletic and involved in extracurriculars at Woods Cross High School. Though there were some reports of Sue having run away from home in the past, she seemed relatively happy and she always returned home of her own accord. In 1975, she was 15 years old. She stood at 5'7 tall and weighed around 120 pounds. She had brown hair and hazel eyes. She had pierced ears and had braces at the time of her disappearance. And that's all we really know about Sue. As stated above, Sue had ridden her bike from Bountiful to Provo, Utah, to attend a conference at Brigham Young University. June 27, 1975 was the first day of the conference. She attended a formal ball that night, which was meant to kick off the conference activities. She was dressed for the occasion in a floor-length yellow dress. She was last seen departing the party after telling some friends she wanted to go back to her room to brush her teeth. Her room was about a quarter of a mile away from the hall in which the party was held. It is not known for sure if she made it back to her room, though the toothbrush was dry and clearly had not recently been used when investigators arrived to search for signs of Sue. The investigation was seemingly taken seriously once Sue's disappearance was noted, which is a surprising change of pace. I feel the need to point this out after having so many cases considered runaways right off the bat. And Sue did have a history of leaving home unannounced, running away, but that did not stop the investigators from taking the disappearance seriously. This is likely due to the fact that, at this point, there was a stream of missing young women in Utah and investigators knew that the cases were likely linked. They had no time to waste. For what it's worth, all investigations should be treated with swiftness and tact. Just have to throw that out there. Newspaper articles issued calls for information and encouragement for those with information to report their tips to the Brigham Young University Security Office. The only sighting that surfaced was from a professor at BYU who claimed Susan was at the back of his classroom attempting to sell a textbook. Though he did identify Sue from a provided photo, this sighting is highly contested. This was seemingly the only lead investigators were able to find, and it led nowhere. The case eventually grew cold, and it remained that way, all the way up until 45 minutes prior to Bundy's execution, when he confessed to abducting and murdering Sue. This is another one of those maddeningly vague Bundy confessions. He confessed to taking a young girl from the Brigham Young University campus in June of 1975. He then was given maps to identify where he had hidden her remains. Bundy pointed to a spot just south of Price, Utah, which is about 60 miles southeast of Provo. He was detailed in giving directions to the burial site, but details of the abduction and actual murder were not offered. Sue's murder was one of the last Bundy confessed to before heading to the electric chair. After the confession, Investigators in Utah followed those detailed directions to the supposed site of burial armed with metal detectors. Remember, Sue had braces at the time of her disappearance. Even if she were buried, the metal detectors would have picked up on them. Unfortunately, nothing was found at that site or anywhere else. The location of Sue Curtis's remains remain unknown. If you or anyone you know, please contact the proper authorities. Sue and her family deserve to find any small measure of closure that can be afforded to them. Sue deserves to be back with her family and have a hallowed final resting place. Any tips or information should be passed on to the Brigham Young University Police at 801-422-5208 in reference to case number 14BY00782. The name is case number for this case is 27748. Number 5.
Lynette was born on July 31, 1962 in Renton, Washington. I can't find her mother's name, but we know her father was named Edward. Lynette was the youngest of three children, though one of the children passed away before Lynette was born. The Culver family moved to Idaho in 1967, when Lynette was only five years old. By all accounts, she was a happy child who had no known issues. She was a little shy until she was comfortable with someone. She had a good relationship with her parents and her older sister. In 1975, she stood at around 5'2 and weighed about 110 pounds. She had brown hair and hazel eyes. She was in the seventh grade at Alameda Junior High, where maintained good grades and had a budding social life. The only negative thing I've come across in my research about Lynette is that she had a small habit of skipping school. On May 5, 1975, Lynette left Alameda Junior High during her lunch break. She had not mentioned any plans to leave school to anyone that we know of, though this is not necessarily strange as Lynette had a habit of cutting class. It is not known where she went that afternoon, but a few hours later, she was seen getting on a bus at Hawthorne Junior High. The two middle schools are just over a mile away from each other, for reference. The bus was headed to Fort Hall, roughly 10 miles north of Pocatello. It is unknown why Lynette would have been headed to Fort Hall. This is the last substantiated sighting of Lynette. She was last seen wearing a burgundy jacket with a fur hood, a red checkered shirt, and jeans. The investigators initially, and this will come as a shock to precisely no one, considered Lynette a runaway. They had an unsubstantiated report that Lynette was last seen at a local Indian reservation. Other cryptic tips reinforced the idea that Lynette had run away from home for unspecified reasons. But not a single one of these tips were backed up with evidence. They seemed to be coming from people that just wanted the attention from being involved in an investigation, seriously check out this newspaper article specifically for some quotes. But as time wore on and the Culver family did not hear from Lynette, the idea that foul play was involved in her disappearance became more and more probable. Her family knew that Lynette would not, could not have stayed gone for so long without contacting them. Even as the case grew cold, the family did not lose hope. Lynette's father would fly to the location of any reported sighting of Lynette to investigate the area himself. Lynette's grandfather would return to Alameda Junior High again and again to search for clues that would shed even the slightest light onto what happened to her. They never, ever gave up hope. So the one thing connecting Bundy to the disappearance of Lynette Culver is his confession. He claimed he drove to Pocatello, Idaho with the intention of finding a young woman to murder. He came across Lynette at some point and abducted her. He then claimed to have taken her to a hotel room where he raped her and drowned her. He then drove to the nearby Snake River, where he disposed of her body. While Bundy did not know his victim's name, Lynette's missing persons case was the only one from Pocatello that fit Bundy's description. He claimed to have known that his victim's family had recently moved across Pocatello, which is not something that someone who hadn't spoken to Lynette or her family would have known unless they had been observing the Culvers for an extended period of time. Which doesn't seem possible based on the established movements of Bundy at the time. Of course, the case was moderately publicized, so it is perhaps possible that Bundy had familiarized himself with the case to mess with the police? Inflict harm? I'm not entirely sure why Bundy would lie about murdering a 12-year-old girl, but I certainly would not put it past him. Even though Bundy confessed to Lynette's abduction and murder, the case is far from wrapped up. No sign of Lynette has ever been found, and her family struggles to find closure without concrete proof of her moving on. The Pocatello Police Department encourages anyone with information about the day Lynette went missing to contact them at 2082346100, even if you think what you know seems innocuous or unimportant. You should also reach out if you believe you have information regarding the whereabouts of Lynette's remains. Her family deserves any sort of closure they can get, and Lynette deserves a proper final resting place. The Pocatello PD case number is 70920. The National Crime Information Center case number is M741629371. The NamUs case number is 9765. 
The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is 666,695. Number 6. Despite the amount of information out there about Denise's disappearance and Bundy's confession to her abduction and murder, there is depressingly little information available about what she was like in life. We know that she was born on August 10, 1950. She lived in Grand Junction, Colorado her whole life. Her friends described her as being a great, kind person. In 1970, she married a man named Joe Oliverson. In 1975, that marriage was going through a rocky patch. And that's about all we know, besides her vital statistics. Denise was last known to stand at about 5'4 tall and weigh around 105 pounds. She had brown hair and blue eyes. On the afternoon of April 6, 1975, Denise left her Grand Junction area home in anger. She had apparently been in an argument with her husband that afternoon and they could not reach any sort of understanding or resolution. We've all been there, talking in circles, making no progress, only succeeding in getting more and more frustrated as the argument wears on. In an effort to cool off, Denise removed herself from the situation. She hoped a bike ride would help clear her head. She apparently had a habit of riding to her parents' house when she needed a break from her husband. At least, that's what he figured she was doing that afternoon. But that was the last time he would ever see her, wearing a green long-sleeved shirt with jeans and sandals, riding her yellow 10-speed bike away from him. Denise was reported missing on April 7, when her husband called her parents to see if she was planning on coming home, only to find out she'd never made it to their home in the first place. Police seemingly jumped into action, mapping out Denise's most likely route and searching the roadside along it. Their search was fruitful, her bike was discovered only a block from her home, beneath a viaduct. Her sandals were found alongside the bike, almost as if someone had tossed both items beneath the viaduct so they could not be easily spotted from the road. This all but confirmed the idea that foul play was involved in Denise's sudden roadside disappearance. Unfortunately for Denise's family, the leads began and ended with that discovery. They were forced to sit back and watch as the case grew cold. There don't seem to be any reports of any tips or leads until Bundy confessed on death row in 1989. Again, there are two parts here to link Bundy to Denise's disappearance. First, investigators discovered gas receipts that placed Bundy in the Grand Junction area on the day that Denise disappeared. And second, of course, Bundy confessed to her abduction and murder. According to Bundy, he somehow got her into his car and strangled her to death. He then drove about five miles west of Grand Junction, which would have put him near the Utah border. He claimed to have placed Denise's body into the Colorado River. This is a point to be emphasized because Bundy typically either placed his victims in the wilderness or buried them. As of the writing of this post, Denise's remains have not been discovered. Though Denise's case has been officially closed, her remains have never been located. If you or anyone you know has information regarding the whereabouts of Denise Oliverson's remains, please contact the Grand Junction Police Department at 970-244-355 in reference to case number 751585. Number 7. Julie Cunningham was born on January 10, 1949. She was friendly and outgoing. She loved going out with friends. The term social butterfly seems fitting for her. In The Stranger Beside Me, Anne Rule reported that Julie had gone through a tough breakup in early March of 1975, leading her to become depressed and despondent. Julie also had an interest in staying active, which was easy to achieve in Vail. She especially enjoyed skiing. In 1975, Julie worked two part-time jobs one as a ski instructor and one as a cashier at a sporting goods store. In the early evening hours of March 15, 1975, Julie left her apartment. She'd just gotten off of the phone with her mother. The call had apparently mostly consisted of talk about Julie's recent heartbreak and getting things off her chest made her feel a bit better. Julie decided to head down to a local tavern where her roommate was already out for the night. She dressed in jeans, a brown jacket made of suede, boots, and a ski cap. But she never arrived at the tavern and never arrived back to her apartment that night. 
In fact, no sign of Julie Cunningham has ever been found. I normally give a rundown of the investigation in these missing persons posts, but I could find absolutely nothing about steps taken to find Julie in the days, months, and years after she went missing. I can only assume that the typical steps were taken the missing persons report, the searches, the appeals for tips, but I simply can't find anything about it online. If you have any info or newspaper clippings about the search for Julie Cunningham, shoot me an email. I would love to see them. The only things connecting Bundy to Julie's disappearance are the fact that Bundy was known to be in the Vale area at the time of the disappearance, the fact that Julie matched his victim profile, and Bundy's own confession. Those first two points are self-explanatory, so let's get into the details of the confession. Bundy claimed that on March 15, 1975, he stopped in Vale and fell back onto an old ruse. He feigned a knee injury and hobbled down a street while carrying a pair of ski boots. The end game was to get someone a young woman with dark hair to help pour him to his car. And unfortunately, Julie was the kind soul to see him that night. She allegedly offered to help him to his car by carrying his ski boots for him. Of course he took her up on the offer. In true Bundy fashion, however, he knocked her out when they reached his car. He then handcuffed her before closing her in the trunk of the car. Then Bundy claims he drove up near Rifle, Colorado. This drive is nearly 90 miles long and would have taken about an hour and a half. Once in Rifle, Bundy removed Cunningham from the trunk and strangled her to death. He left her body in the desert there but apparently returned weeks later to bury her. Bundy offered no explanation as to why he took Julie so far away but the idea seems to be that it would be harder to connect the missing person's case to a body being found if it was further away from the point of abduction. Bundy also offered no reasoning for burying her, saying it was just something he did. If you have any information about Julie's disappearance or current whereabouts, please contact the proper authorities. As this is one of the more vague Bundy confessions, the Vale Police Department has encouraged anyone who possibly has information to contact them. Vale PD can be reached via phone at 970-479-2200 in reference to case number 750806 and name as case number 12084. Number 8. Nancy Wilcox was born on July 4, 1958 to Herbert and Connie Wilcox. She had five siblings, four brothers and a sister, though I could not find anything about where Nancy fell in the birth order. In 1974, she was 16 years old and a junior at Olympus High School, where she had an active social life. She enjoyed cheerleading and participating in her church. She and her family were of Mormon faith. She stood around 5'6 and weighed around 120 pounds. She had brown hair and brown eyes. And on a seemingly normal day in October, she would vanish. On October 2, 1974, Nancy Wilcox left her school to go buy a pack of gum. A few individuals near the school claimed to have spotted Nancy in the passenger seat of a yellow Volkswagen bug shortly after she left school. This is the last time anyone ever saw any sign of Nancy. At the time of her disappearance, Nancy was wearing a new Noi brand coat, a dress, size 9, and shoes, size 6 one half. No further information is available regarding the description of Nancy's clothing. It's unclear how quickly Nancy was reported missing, though the investigation did not get off on a good foot. According to most sources, authorities did not take Nancy's disappearance seriously, considering her runaway from the get-go. I think it's important to keep context in mind here, though. These officers were not on high alert like departments in Washington, as Nancy was one of the first in a long line of missing women in Utah. Of course, this is not to diminish the culpability of the investigators in writing the disappearance off as a runaway case without taking evidence into consideration. It was clear that Nancy had every intention of returning to her life after her errand. She left all of her belongings behind, including jewelry that she held near and dear to her heart. She also had no trouble in her personal life or relationships. There was no reason for her to run away and no reason for her case to be written of as a runaway. This is another case in which the Bundy connection is twofold. First, Nancy was last seen in a yellow Volkswagen bug and we know that Bundy drove a car that fit that description. 
Bundy was also known to have been in the Holiday area of Utah at the time of Nancy's disappearance. However, Bundy disputed the idea that Nancy had ever been in his car, no matter what witnesses said. The second part of the Bundy connection here is that he confessed to Nancy's abduction and murder. He claimed he abducted her by knife point and took her to a nearby orchard to sexually assault her. He then strangled her to death before transporting her to Capitol Reef National Park and burning her remains. It's important to note that this park is roughly 216 miles away from Halliday, where Nancy was allegedly abducted from. I have to pause here to again call bullshit on Bundy. First of all, he's clearly lying about Nancy, having never been in his car, since he buried her in a park that is a three and a half hour drive away. Secondly, there's no way that no one would have not noticed Nancy acting strangely, walking with a strange man. People noticed her riding in a car behaving normally, if something out of the ordinary happened, that would have stuck in their minds. Why really bothers me about this is the why, why would he lie about having her in his car? What was he trying to obscure? This case seems to have a bit more hope when it comes to tips. Bundy's information is vague at best, and no sign of her has ever been found. So, at this point in the series, I think you all know the drill, if you or anyone you know think they have information regarding the disappearance and alleged murder of Nancy Wilcox, please contact the proper authorities. Though her parents and two of her brothers have passed on without knowing the truth of Nancy's final moments, her three other siblings are still out there searching for answers. They deserve to know what happened, and Nancy deserves to have her full story told. Pass any information to the Unified Police Department at 801-743-7000 in reference to case number 74 to 54455.